The more humanity strays from its origin, the more we deny our bond with nature, the farther from perfection we become. We are the only creatures on the planet that use symbols in reference to something else. We use symbols for absolutely everything the mind can conceive of. There is at least one word or icon or gesture to insinuate everything our five senses can detect and then some. But along with this beautiful gift comes a flaw. Most people are unwilling to seek and create their own interpretations of these symbols. Instead, they blindly submit to preconceived definitions and connotations given by sources unknown. Because of this, many things have been predetermined in our understanding of life without our knowledge. Words can be perverted and used to manipulate rather than to inform. Symbols can be used to segregate rather than unite. And those given the responsibility and authority to disseminate information to the public possess the ability to do with it what they choose. Listen carefully. Every 26,000 years, our solar system passes through the 12 zodiac signs. Ancient civilizations such as the Hopi, Egyptians, Cherokee, Apache, and the Mayans were aware of this great cycle and developed calendars according to it. This cycle stems from many different occurrences in nature such as the sun's orbit around Alcyon, the central star of Pleiades, as well as the 260-day cycle of human gestation. This cycle is broken down into five sub-cycles of 5,125 years each, which were thought to have their own age. The Aztec calendar or Mesoamerican sunstone depicted each cycle being destroyed by one of the five elements. The cycle we are currently in is the age of the fifth sun, 3113 BC to 2012 AD. More precisely, this great cycle ends December 21st, 2012. Mayan cultures and civilizations were aware of this end date and Nostradamus even prophesied about it. For Earth, which we are currently in now, is also known as the movement, shift, evolution, and consciousness. Living Maya timekeepers proclaim that the Earth has been through fire, earth, air, and water. The final element is ether, or center. The Hopi believe that the fourth world of destruction closes and the fifth world of peace begins on December 21st, 2012. The Great Cycle is broken down into what the Mayans believe to be 13 Bactons. Earth began its 13th Bactan in 1618, which was known as the Triumph of Materialism, as well as the Time of Great Forgetting, in the prediction that humanity will lose the awareness of their true bond with nature by means of external possessions. This is where ego and domination became the predominant ambition of the civilized world. Not surprisingly, this time frame was precisely when the worldwide coordination of Pope Gregory XIII forced the 12-month calendar as well as the first mechanical clock onto indigenous peoples. This is what's known as the error in time. Before the inception of the two instruments by the Roman Catholic Church, each year was divided into 13 moon cycles with 28 days each. But the most detrimental part of these two instruments is the insinuation that time was something external, something inorganic and outside the body that we must watch and obey. The 7th century Mayan prophet Pakal Vatan left a powerful message for future generations of evolution. If humanity wishes to save itself from biospheric destruction, it must return to living in natural time. He also foretold of our accelerated technological society and of the damage of our collective divergence from natural law in exchange for material values. Astrology and the studies of the heavens are as old as civilization. Throughout the past several thousand years, new religions have all but replaced the pagan religions of prior years. Man has been so thoroughly fascinated with these objects in the sky that they formed constellations from them and applied stories to them. In Greek mythology, these were personified as the gods. We notice in the structures that still stand to this day that the most ancient of civilizations put forth more wealth, power, time, and effort into the locations of the stars than any other practice. 
this is commonly written off as simple curiosity. But the truth is becoming clear by the day as we close in on the zero year of December 21st, 2012. It is a common misconception that the pagan religion is rarely practiced today. In fact, paganism in its evolution is the most widely practiced form of religion. You may ask yourself how this is possible. The answer is hidden in nearly all of our current popular religions. But who would have the power and the desire to integrate a seemingly long gone religion into such popular opposite denominations? Dr. Adam Weishaupt was born on February 6, 1748 in Ingolstadt in a city in Bayern or Bavaria, Germany. This interesting character was the son of a rabbi and converted to Catholicism after his father's death. After studying French philosophers such as Voltaire, he supposedly learned the teachings of Satanism in the French royal court. World famous central banker, Mayor Amschel Rothschild of the Rothschild dynasty, chose Weishaupt to create the Coven of Golden Dawn which to this day is Rothschild's private coven. Amstel Rothschild, for those who are unaware, instigated the American Revolution, America's supposed liberation from Britain. Rothschild instructed Weishaupt to create the ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria. This is better known as the Order of the Illuminati. The name in Luciferian teachings means the bearer of the light, the illuminated, or the enlightened one. The Areopagite, or Tribunal, was the inner circle of the Supreme Order and were the only ones privy to secret meetings. In Nesta Webster's book, The World Revolution, she states, The art of Illuminism lay in enlisting dupes as well as adepts, and by encouraging dreams of honest visionaries or the schemes of fanatics, by flattering the vanity of ambitious egotists, by working on unbalanced brains, or by playing such passions as greed and power to make men of totally divergent aims serve the secret purpose of the sect. People with money were welcomed but kept oblivious to actual secrets. The purpose is to win power and riches, to undermine secular or religious government, and obtain the masters of the world. The goal of the order was and still is to one day deliver the human race from all religion. Progression through the political and religious hierarchy was obtained by blackmail in the form of bribing people in power with sex from local prostitutes. In the 16th and 17th century, high-ranking officials in political or religious organizations were liable to be sentenced to death for such acts. In 1780, Baron Franz Friedrich Kinnigi was recruited. He was the most instrumental person in the marriage of the Masons and the Illuminati. This allowed the Illuminati to expand rapidly with the use of Masonic lodges. On August 29, 1781, Congress of Wilhelmsbad declared the alliance official. Those in attendance were put under oath, never to reveal what took place in that meeting. Comte de Virio, a mason from Martinez de Lodge at Lyons, was questioned about the meeting upon his arrival home. He stated, I can only tell you that all this is much more serious than you think. The conspiracy which is being woven is so well thought out that it will be, so to speak, impossible for the monarchy and the church to escape it. He later denounced the Illuminati. Sir John D. John D. was a servant to Queen Elizabeth Tudor of the Tudor dynasty. John D. was the head of the British Secret Service, the MI5. He was also known for the practice of black magic and his affiliation with the occult. If this is your first time hearing about the occult, or are unaware of its dominance in the world to this day, pay close attention. Pagan symbols, gods, rituals, and doctrines are the basis for most every religion practiced throughout the world. The Christian or Catholic symbols of the cross derive from the solstice and the equinox division lines on a zodiac calendar. The word heaven is in reference to what pagan religions referred to as the heavens, or galactic bodies and the crossing of the age of Pisces into Aquarius is actually in reference to constellations which interestingly enough occur at the exact same time as the great cycle prophesied by the Maya as well as many other cultures. As said before, pantheistic rituals are prevalent in all monotheistic religions today. Circumcision is a pagan ritual marking males in a ceremonial fashion. Weddings are pagan by nature in the wearing of a ring which symbolizes the ring of Saturn. Funerals follow the same pagan-derived ritual when a sacred geometrical tomb is placed over a grave to embody and immortalize the spirit.
Baptism is a ritual to submerge a child in holy water to symbolize the renewal of life, just as rain replenishes the earth. The Holy Grail, filled with wine, is a representation of the blood that comes from the birth canal during menstruation, not the blood of Christ. This ritual was taken over by the patriarchal society. Males could not give life as women do, so to symbolize a male giving life was to draw blood, which could only be done by injury. In ancient Egypt, the goddess Isis was the personification of wisdom. Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the warship to himself as he proclaimed himself Amun-Re, the sun god. The word Amen at the end of a prayer spawned from the praise given to Amun-Re. From there, the Hebrews left Egypt and traveled north into the Middle East, where they encountered the Canaanites, who worshipped the god of Saturn, El. The merging of these three gods became the name of the land today, which is known as Isis, Re, El, or Israel. 98% of Judaism is based around the worship of Saturn. And the sacred day of worship is Saturday. The worship practice on Sunday is originated from the Egyptians who worship the sun god. Most people simply pass these things off and never question their origins, but this just scratches the surface of the pagan influence over the present day. It is not just found in religions, it is found right here in our own backyard. On January 22, 1783, Congress ratified a contract stating that all bills of credit emitted, monies borrowed, and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States in pursuance of the present Confederation shall be deemed and considered a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction whereof the United States and the public faith are hereby solemnly pledged. The party that the U.S. owed these loans to? King George. I hope this paints a picture for you of how Great Britain funded both sides of the revolution. To this day, Great Britain collects taxes from the United States via the IRS. The IRS isn't even an agency of the United States government. If you don't believe me, look up IRS Publication 6209. The FCC, CIA, FBI, and NASA were never part of the United States government. The U.S. government only holds shares of the stock in various agencies. Social security numbers are also issued by the U.N. through the IMF. The Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865, was also instigated by Amschel Rothschild to divide the United States and force it into debt with the central bank. The goal was to put the country of the U.S. back into the hands of Britain through huge loans taken out for munitions. To do this, it was crucial to put a controversial issue in limbo such as slavery. Knowing full well that the Declaration of Independence would create an uproar among southern states that depended heavily upon slave labor, it was signed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by 35 people, 33 of whom were Freemasons. John Brown was a Mason and a Rosicrucian who was brought to power by William Lloyd Garrison and Senator Charles Sumner, both descendants of the Illuminati bloodline. With the help of the New York Times, John Brown was built up to be a hero in the anti-slavery movement. Ulysses S. Grant, former president, was born Hiram S. Grant. This name was given to him by his father, Master Mason Jesse Root Grant. Jesse Root Grant worked for John Brown's father and then went on to work for E.A. Collins, one of the 13 Illuminati bloodlines. Ulysses S. Grant was brought to power rapidly with help from Collins. From April 1861 to May 1864, Grant went from the rank of private to commander-in-chief of the entire Union Army. Once Grant was appointed president, his cabinet consisted of eight Freemasons, including Alfonso Taft, which was William Taft's father, who was also an ancestor of Bill Clinton. Jonas Mills Bundy was one of the 13 Illuminati bloodlines, who was also the presidential advisor to Grant as well as the next two presidents. And cabinet member Columbus Delano was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's grandfather. In November 21, 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt wrote, 
The real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Abraham Lincoln's father was A. A. Springs, who was part of the Rothschild dynasty. Lincoln's half-brother worked for Louis Cass Pazur in the Merovingian dynasty, which was the 13th Illuminati bloodline. Pazur also owned Jekyll Island, which was where the Federal Reserve Bank was created. In the mid-1800s, Abraham Lincoln and the Whigs were trying desperately to keep Andrew Jackson from establishing a gold standard called the Independent Treasury System. Lincoln and his party fought to set up a central bank, making such public speeches as, under a gold and silver standard, all will suffer more or less, and very many will lose everything that renders life desirable. This statement resounds elements of scare tactics in this speech and other speeches on the matter given by Abraham Lincoln. They give no real evidence or explanation. In the early 1900s, after a failed attempt for Woodrow Wilson to set up what was called the League of Nations following World War I, Wilson and his advisor, Colonel House, set up the Institute of International Affairs. This institute had two branches, one set up in England called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the Council on Foreign Relations was incorporated as the American branch in New York on July 29, 1921. Founding members include Colonel House, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and a few others. A national income tax was declared unconstitutional in 1895 by the Supreme Court, but a constitutional amendment was proposed in Congress by Senator Nelson Aldrich. This makes much more sense when you notice that Nelson Aldrich was also known as being the authentic voice of J.P. Morgan and later married into the Rockefeller family. Today, 27 to 35 percent of American workers pay is taxed, and this money goes to a central bank called the Federal Reserve, or the Fed. For those of you who are unaware of the Federal Reserve Bank and what it is capable of, it is a non-government owned bank that provides the U.S. with all of its currency. They control the inflation rate by the amount of money in circulation. Yet the most amazing aspect of the central bank is the suspension of specie payments, in which the Fed can refuse to pay their obligations, yet taxpayers must pay their debts or go bankrupt. In other words, the suspension of specie payments is the central bank's right to breach a contract with no penalty whatsoever. In even simpler terms, it's called theft. How is it that the Fed is allowed to breach any contract they wish without penalty from the government? The answer is simple. The Federal Reserve Bank has power over the government instead of under it. Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor while at Georgetown University, wrote of central banks, They want nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. It is important to know that nearly all of the founders of the Federal Reserve Bank were involved in the conception of the Council on Foreign Relations. Since 1934, when the Fed was established, almost every United States Secretary of State, all Secretaries of War or Defense since Henry L. Stimson, almost every head of CIA since Alan Dulles, nearly all presidential candidates, Dwight D. Eisenhower, JFK, Richard Nixon, and Bill Clinton were members of the CFR. George Bush Sr. was actually the CFR director from 1977 to 1979. Understand that all of these high-ranking government positions were lobbied into place by the organization set up by the international banking cartel. There are secret meetings held everywhere by many of the same members in the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, the United Nations, and the two branches of the Institute of International Affairs. These groups make up what is known as the Round Table, developed by Cecil Rhodes. Other offshoots or preliminary groups are the Bohemian Group and Yale University's Skull and Bones Organization, which we all know George W. Bush, George Bush Sr., and John Kerry were all a part of. Most every meeting by these groups are attended by the most powerful government officials, corporate leaders, media moguls, and royal families in the world. These meetings are held in secret and not a word of them reaches the mainstream media. How is it that so many powerful people can attend meetings alongside the mainstream media and not a mention of it makes it to the public? This all may start making more sense when you start understanding that common citizens aren't meant to know what is happening at the top. 
Is there any dispute that to gain power in our day and age, it takes strategy and intelligence rather than brute force? Logic will tell you that in any sport or game, to claim victory, you must keep your moves strategic and secret. Why would it be any different in global politics? If I bring up Chess Master up here and ask him what are the principles Wojciech can become a master of the game of chess, he'll say these four things. He'll say that you need a sense of patience. Now, if you don't have patience, don't even try to begin the game to learn it. He'll say you need a sense of timing. If you don't have a sense of timing, don't open the book. You have to have knowledge of your opponent. right? And then the fourth one that they'll tell you is that you need to have the willingness to make any and all sacrifices. Now, ladies and gentlemen, why are the dark side winning the game? It's because they've got infinite patience. They've been working on one thing for 50,000 years. I call that patience. They've got a brilliant sense, sense of timing because they know all about the astrology and the divination that we forgot that our agricultural ancestors all knew about. Well, we're with the Julian calendar and we're not interested in any of that stuff anymore. We're slaves of the watch, but we don't know about the higher time to rule our own lives by. They have amazing knowledge of you Right? They have intense knowledge of us, their enemies. And the fourth one is the clincher, isn't it? Because they're willing to make any and all sacrifices when and wherever they need to do it. But Ada, that would break our treaty. You're a good guy. Why, you hate war. You wouldn't go back on your word. Are you kidding? <laughs> George W. Bush is a direct descendant of Godfrey de Bullion. The Bullions were servants of Pope Gregory VII and led the European noblemen into the crusade in order to recapture Jerusalem from the Islamic faith. He became the first king of Jerusalem and Duke of Lower Lorraine, which was known as a major region for the bloodline linked to the Illuminati. Bush is closely related to every European monarch. He is the 13th cousin of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles. He also has kinship with every member of the British royal family, the House of Windsor. The House of Windsor is known for abandoning their German names after World War I due to criticism of the people. A lesser known fact about the House of Windsor, however, is the heavy funding contribution to bring Adolf Hitler to power in the rise of World War II. The swastika is actually a symbol of the sun, referencing to the sun order of the occult. The word Nazi is actually Nazi, one of the Anunnaki children of Mother Goddess Ninharsog in the Sumerian texts. And even the word Holocaust is actually Yiddish for burned sacrifice offering. Heinrich Himmler was the commander of the SS and one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany. Himmler was a seventh ray occultist and was very influenced by the book Estara by George Lunds, who was an Austrian mystic. This occult book mapped out the plan for a cleansing of ethnicities and bringing about one race and to revive the ancient tradition of the Knights Templar of the Middle Ages. The Knights Templar were a group largely killed off by the French monarchy. The remaining Templar created many Masonic orders and secret societies throughout Europe from which the Illuminati is believed to have originated. It's important to note as well that the Bush family's ancestor, Godfrey de Bullion, was a Holy Templar himself. To this day, every single United States president, with no exception, has a direct bloodline relation to British monarchs. And on December 20th, 1993, George Herbert Walker Bush was knighted by the Queen of England as a Knight Grand Cross of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath for his leadership in the Gulf War. Does it strike you as odd that our president, our leader, kneeled before the Queen of England in a ceremony that symbolizes allegiance? So what does this all mean? 
It simply means that throughout every major civilization, political power has remained in a select few bloodlines, and it is desperately held in the same manner today. It is openly admitted to the public that major leaders worldwide are part of secret fraternal orders or secret meetings. But what is not disclosed to the public is the purpose of these meetings. So let me spell this out for you. The major leaders from around the world are part of a united effort to remain in power forever. To do so, the people are lured into the trap of perpetual debt, making it impossible to be repaid by the people. So in turn, all property and assets will be repossessed by the debtor. For those of you who are unaware what it means when a government owns everything of yours, it's called socialism. All of this is part of an ultimate goal of the mystery religions. The mystery religion is the paganism we've been talking about all along. But the pagan religions known to the public today are nowhere near as involved as the mystery religion. It is much less confusing than you think. Try to imagine this practice as less of a religion and more of an ambition. The ambition is to reach enlightenment. There is no superhuman intelligence or fantasy involved in this. The gifts of God are very simple. Omnipresence. The power of one being or consciousness to be everywhere at once. Omniscience. The power of knowing everything that can be known. And omnipotence. To have unlimited power. We see all of this today. It cannot be denied. If you still don't believe that the mystery religion is present today, just look around you. There are literally thousands of statues and emblems of ancient religions on every political establishment. Even on military uniforms, these symbols are found everywhere, but not only in our country. The same emblems are found on every nation's military uniform. And why would this be? Because a life taken at a chosen time, place, and a specific manner, it becomes a sacrifice. And to further illustrate this point, on March 20th, 2003, President Bush launched bombing of Baghdad at 5.50 Baghdad time. This lasted into March 21st. It was called shock and awe by the mainstream media. But according to the mystery religion, this date is known as the Eve of Ostara, more commonly known as the Spring or Vernal Equinox. Occultists worship the goddess of the earth, Gaia, on this day. The Druids knew this date as the Spring Fertility Rite, the Day of Feast. The war was promptly ended on May 1st, 2003. This date is known in the Druidic calendar as Beltane, or Walpurgis Night. It was named after Saint Walpugar, who was the pagan goddess of fertility. From March 20th to May 1st, the pagan ritual is to give blood to the earth and renew life to the goddess of fertility. What better time frame to declare a bloody war on the days of a ritual sacrifice and end it exactly when the pagan ritual ends? The parallels are uncanny. These are all facts written in many different sources around the world and are available to anyone to discover. Connecting the dots is up to you, but make your own decisions instead of settling for conclusions that others have put in place before you. The right answers are what you decide are the right answers. Maybe everything I'm telling is wrong. I mean, I can tell you what I think happens to be more or less right, but there isn't any reason why you should pay any attention to it. Now you know why they're out to destroy you. Today there is so much confusion about what Christianity is, because everything I thought that was Christianity, I found out wasn't. If this continues, there will be an overthrow of all things. Yea, this change and overthrow is deliberately planned. There is nothing going on today in the United States of America by accident. Nothing. There is 
nothing going on in the Catholic Church today that's happening by accident. They were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. If you understand esoteric writing, what you do is you try to confuse so the common people like you will not understand what's said. So you take an idea and you put it at the beginning and the end of the sentence and then you intersperse all sorts of uh, you know, things in the middle to confuse common people like you. And it all goes back to these ancient times and tapping into the mystery of religions. The occult is in total working control of America today and that is why we're at war in the Middle East. What is it all about? It is part of the continuing world revolution, it is part of the move to bring about World War III and ultimately then the One World Order and the New World Religion. This information is backed up by scholars, teachers, philosophers, doctors and professionals in every respective field all around the world. The reasons why the majority of people don't know about this is because over 80% of the population gets their world news strictly from the mainstream media. And if you trace every major media station's chain of command to the top, you will find the same people who own the corporations that lobby every high-ranking political official into place. And for those of you who are unaware of this one world government and one world religion, I challenge you to do an internet search on the New World Order. You will be overwhelmed by the amount of people trying to get the word out to the masses. This exemplifies the findings that 87% of the population formulates their belief structure according to other people's ideas. Only 13% formulate their beliefs on logic and evaluation. And sadly, the two greatest factors that lead to the ignorance of the public are as follows. You support the mission Push it from here? How brave you are! Real careful as you march towards that Capitol building. Be real careful for who you think is in there waiting to help you. Be real careful. Group think. It is a term to describe a group unwilling to look beyond the overall consensus of the herd. Many times it is out of a lack of drive or ambition to ask original questions to arrive at genuine answers. But more importantly and dangerously, it is also an occurrence that spawns from the fear of looking foolish in front of peers. Both religion and politics are forms of groupthink. Words such as patriotism and faith are both fancy words that ultimately mean blind submission. Supposedly, it is considered heresy or unpatriotic to question the words of your leader. So the fear of upsetting the superior higher power has forced the herd to practice groupthink regardless of what it leads to. And one of the greatest examples of groupthink is the stigma given to conspiracy theories. The phrase conspiracy theory gives a distinct impression to the average person. The JFK assassination, Area 51, Roswell, government cover-ups, strange disappearances. These subjects probably sound a bit too fantasy for the average person, and it's quite understandable. They're supposed to sound made up. Throughout the mistranslation of time and embellishment of these stories, facts were added or omitted. Some may be true and some may be false, but one thing is for sure. If a global secret needed to remain hidden yet began emerging among the public, the best cover-up is to embellish or alter the story until it sounds ludicrous. So what happens when the secret involves the government and the government has intimate ties to the mainstream media? And the mainstream media, as said before, has been proven to sway at least 80% of the public's opinion. The logic is undeniable. Media in every form is put in place to make people feel stupid for even keeping an open mind towards conspiracy theories. Movies, books, fairy tales, and folklore are all tools to make the average person feel insane for supporting or believing in a conspiracy. And why shouldn't they? Our leaders have no problems telling us not to investigate or believe in these theories. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. 
The most basic of pagan practices is the control of human population to have a perfect balance between man and nature. The goal is to bring the population down to 500 million, which is over a 90% reduction in humanity. Now that we have abandoned everything we've been trained to think prior to this moment, we can start looking at the world for what it is, instead of what people tell us it is. Open your eyes today as if you've never seen the world before, and you will begin to notice that the goal of population reduction is everywhere around us. And let me assure you that absolutely nothing that I'm going to tell you is exaggerated, is interpolated, or is imagined. Everything I'm going to tell you is documented. He who controls food controls the world. Well, they said in 1962, we're going to work toward total global implementation of Codex Alimentarius on December 31st, 2009. They were sort of guidelines. Now, Codex Alimentarius Commission is administered by the World Health Organization, WHO, and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. They fund Codex and they run it at the request of the UN. So they're mommy and daddy to Codex Alimentarius. In 1994, Codex, with no notice here in this country whatsoever, declared nutrients, put on your intellectual seatbelts, declared nutrients to be toxins. They're poisons. Under Codex, every dairy cow on the planet must be treated with Monsanto's recombinant bovine growth hormone. Furthermore, under Codex, every animal used for food on the planet must be treated with subclinical antibiotics and must be treated with exogenous growth hormones. If you do the numbers in the WHO FAO projections, the epidemiological projections, they estimate, not I, that just the vitamin and mineral guideline alone when it goes into global implementation on December 31st, 2009, will result in a minimum of three billion, that's B, bad, big, billion deaths. One billion through simple starvation. Those folks who die are not particularly economically successful from the point of view of the corporations. But the next two billion, they will die from the preventable diseases of undernutrition. Who will live? Probably those people who are wealthy enough and powerful enough to have their own pushers of clean food and nutrients. So we need your help because the United States leadership is what's going to literally save the population of the planet. The UN has put out dozens of public documents where they're calling for an 80% world population reduction. In fact, at the Beijing Women's Conference, the World Conference, back in 1997, the head of the UN food program said, we will use food as a weapon against the people. Sixty-six percent of the United States residents' public water is fluoridated. It is known to have tremendous effects on bone cancer, joint problems, bone weakness, lowered estrogen and testosterone levels, and dental fluorosis, which is yellowing of the teeth and pitting in the enamel. Wouldn't it make more sense to enhance public water with vitamins which are meant to be ingested to promote overall health? Rather than putting such a toxic chemical in our water with a bogus explanation that it will improve our dental health. We now know that fluoride causes more dental problems than it solves. Something doesn't seem right about this. 
Do you honestly believe that these companies care deeply enough for the people to spend large amounts of their own money to fluoridate public water when the people already purchase their own toothpaste? But there's a difference between toothpaste and drinking water. We don't ingest toothpaste. If you go to any hardware store and look at any rat poison product, you will only find one ingredient, sodium fluoride. It is the most toxic ionic molecule outside of potassium dichromate. Now Danon, along with other companies, have begun fluoridating bottled water. It is becoming increasingly difficult to get away from. And the fact that fluoride is also used in many prescription antidepressants shows that it eliminates aggression and motivation in people. Fluoride, to my knowledge as a physician, has absolutely no biological benefit whatsoever. Uh, uh, but one of the significant things is that the, the Russians uh, carried out all sorts of experiments on the uh, people living in the Gulag. One of them, of course, was to fluoridate the water. Why? To fluoridate the water, why people are not uh, as aggressive as they ordinarily would be. In fact, what is the active ingredient in Prozac that is so widely distributed in America today? Why well, it's a fluoride compound. And now, we are finding that public water, nationwide, is showing up with arsenic, lead, cadmium, and thermonium, which is a radioactive form of lead. Cancer, lowered sex drive, birth defects, sedation, and brain defects? Does this not sound like a wonder drug for anyone aiming to control a population? It's, it's quite astonishing, Paul, uh, the degree to which environmentalists have not been educated about fluoride. You know, people have an unconscious trust in their doctor or their dentist, and if you can persuade doctors and dentists that fluoride is safe and good, then you're, you're, you're uh, able to reach the rest of the nation. People believe their doctors and dentists, and that was a way of promoting fluoride for Bernays. Fluoride was killing their cattle, destroying their crops. Uh, fluoride given to rats had produced bone cancer and liver cancer and that those results had been doctored to make it look as though fluoride hadn't caused as much cancer. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, um, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening to the results, he says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. And basically I said, yes. Aspartame. The artificial sweetener found in almost every low sugar or sugar free product on the market. First of all, aspartame is made up of three things methanol, which of course is what produces blindness, uh, aspartic acid, and phenylalanine. These are all poisons. Aspartic acid, of course, produces brain lesions. Uh, this was known back in the early 1970s. Methanol produces blindness. Phenylalanine is what you see uh, in the brain, and in high doses, it produces trauma. We're not making this all up. The FDA did publish. Back in, um, I think it was in the 80s, they did publish the 92 potential side effects of aspartame. And they do, you know, these side effects are quite, you know, are extremely serious. Things like dizziness, uh, problems with balance, uh, abdominal pain and cramps, changes in vision, seizures and convulsions, etc., uh, etc. Et so the nervous system seems to be one of the areas that's most effective. So we see people have difficulty thinking. Uh, they feel like they're walking around in a cloud or a fog. Yet despite all of these harmful effects, Donald Rumsfeld pushed it out into the stores in over 5,000 products when he was CEO of Searly, the company that manufactured aspartame.
The sustainable goal is the elimination of the middle class. The world cannot support six billion people. But you see, the plan behind sustainable development includes population control. It's a program for land use control, education control, and population control. The leaders of the sustainable movement say that the world's human population should not exceed 500 million people. That's a 93% reduction of today's population levels. In 1992, while the Rio conference was going on, George Bush, then president, was there. He was just offshore in Prince Charles's yacht, where he executed the Agenda 21 protocols on behalf of the United States and brought it back to Washington, D.C. Within a year, Bill Clinton, by executive order, established the President's Council for Sustainable Development. In 1996, Bill Clinton set up the President's Council on Sustainable Development. One of the dictates of Agenda 21 is that every country in the world is to set up a national council to oversee the implementation of Agenda 21. I've listened to Gorbachev explain we are writing a new set of 10 or 15 commandments to replace the original 10. Which one of the 10 do you think these guys don't like? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Because I'll tell you what, these people have lied to us. They're in the process of stealing all of this nation's natural resources, and they covet everything you have left. To explain the map, the red are areas that are to be off limits to human beings. If you live there, you won't. The yellow areas are the areas for major control of all human activity. If you live there, you won't. The black dots are the smart growth zones. That's where human beings are to be stacked and packed in small living units, along rail tracks. Smart Growth Program ultimately has jobs assigned and children cared for by the state. And in conjunction with Codex Alimentarius, food will be limited and water consumption will be decreased to 10 gallons per day per person. That is over a 90% reduction in people's average daily water consumption. And along with shortages of food and water, the food we will be provided with will be genetically manipulated and nutrient deficient. Genetic manipulation of food causes complications in metabolizing and utilizing food for energy. In June of 2003, scientists reported that the gene sequence of the inserted genes into, into crops had actually changed their order. They had re-scrambled. So the genetic inserts are not stable. Another laboratory confirmed this and found that it changed in the same varieties in different ways that they had tested. So not only is it unstable and changing, it's not even uniform in the way it's changing. This is incredibly dangerous. Nutrient deficiencies due to Codex's planned vitamin and mineral ban will cause billions of preventable diseases. Both of these will ultimately lead to billions of deaths. The question is then how do they do it? How in the world are they getting this agenda from the international level down to the local level? Well, they've got a plan for that too. Now on the environmental side, there's probably a number of different plans, but from the environmental side, you have an organization called the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Been in existence since the United Nations was created. It's not part of the United Nations Charter. It's a scientific advisor to the United Nations. But through the IUCN, such programs as ecosystem management, American Heritage Rivers, the Clean Water Initiative, the Endangered Species Act, and all the rules and regulations of the EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Park Service, and so forth, they also discuss property rights in this particular document. They say that property rights are not absolute they're not unchanging, they're not inalienable like our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence of the States. 
Rather, they are a complex, dynamic, and shifting relationship between two or more parties over space or time. In a biocentric approach, says the IUCN, the rights of nature are defended first and foremost on the grounds of the intrinsic value of animals, plants, rivers, mountains, and ecosystems, rather than simply on the basis of the utilitarian value or benefit to human beings. <clears throat> In other words, nature comes first. Nature's needs comes before man's needs. In a religious context, it's called pantheism, the belief that nature is God. It goes on to say, even worse, people are then members of a community of beings, like human beings, living and non-living. So a rock is now elevated up to the status of a human being, and they are both equal in the eyes of this belief system. It's not hard to imagine that if you believe that humans are the cause of all the Earth's problems, that we're overpopulated. They give two solutions and only two to this problem. The first is that it's estimated that an agricultural world in which most human beings are peasants should be able to support five to seven billion people. Well, folks, we have six billion people right now. That means all of us in this room, or nearly all of us in this room, are going to have to become agrarian peasants if we use this solution. In contrast, they go on to say a reasonable estimate for an industrialized world society at the present North American material standard of living would be one billion people. So if we wanted to maintain our current standard of living, we would have to reduce the Earth's human population by somewhere around 70%. In 1970, just three years after the publication of the Iron Mountain Report, which calls for, if we're going to create a world government, we can no longer use war as a mechanism to cause fear amongst populations and therefore allow us to control the behavior of populations through fear. And they settled on, in 1967, in their publication called the Iron Mountain Report, the Environmental Holocaust. In 1970, three years after that publication, Foreign Relations began to publish a series of articles describing the ecological holocaust that was facing the world. And in this particular issue, the first issue done by George Keenan to prevent a world disaster where it was summed up in three points that the eco-crisis is, is a global threat so great that it endangers all of life on Earth. hottest years ever measured, they've all occurred in the last 14 years, and the hottest of all was 2005. We are causing global warming. This is really not a political issue so much as a moral issue. The temperature increases are taking place all over the world, and that's causing stronger storms. Is it possible that we should prepare against other threats besides terrorists? The Arctic is experiencing faster melting. If this were to go, sea level worldwide would go up 20 feet. This is what would happen in Florida. Around Shanghai, home to 40 million people. The area around Calcutta, 60 million. Here's Manhattan. The World Trade Center Memorial would be underwater. Think of the impact of a couple hundred thousand refugees, and then imagine a hundred million. Those who deny global warming are just flat out wrong. Ellen Goodman from the Boston Globe wrote, Let's just say that global warming deniers are now on par with Holocaust deniers. Scientists silenced for questioning the threat of global warming. You know that I've had several friends who have essentially been told that you, if you speak out as climate on climate change, you must do so as an independent citizen. If you do so through our organization or through our institution, you will essentially be fired. Once you realize how many holes there are in the consensus solution, you may begin to open up your mind to the other side of the global warming debate as a whole. The only consensus I'm aware of is that it's warm in the last century. They, they, they completely ignore the fact that there's this thing called the Oregon Petition that was signed by 19,000 professionals and scientists who don't agree with the idea that we are causing climate change. 
can't tell you how many calls I've received from parents saying their kids are now being shown an inconvenient truth completely unchallenged, not just in science class, but in art and math classes. I have to speak out and say that the science we, are, we have is still incomplete, and the science we're being told by the IPCC is really an incorrect science. Global warming paradoxically causes not only more flooding, but also more drought. Big hurricanes, tornadoes, fearsome diseases, polio, tuberculosis, West Nile virus, avian flu, SARS, polar bears that have actually drowned, mosquitoes, caterpillars, communism, it's slavery, global warming, global warming, global warming. Uh, Aurelia Pecci, who actually created the Club of Rome and is the inner inner circle of the global elitists in 1991 stated that while searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, and the like would fit the bill. All of these dangers are caused by human intervention. The real enemy then is humanity itself. Put this to you bluntly, global warming is a complete fallacy. Al Gore received the Grammy and the Nobel Peace Prize for a film that is filled with holes and mistruths. Ice cores taken 2,000 meters below the surface have enabled us to look at the last 160,000 years. We believe that in Greenland, the medieval warm period was about one and a half degrees warmer on average than, than today. And they also show consistently warmer temperatures thousands of years ago before man-made greenhouse gases existed. Approach our time, we can see that in the period between 4,000 years ago and back to the period 2,000 years ago, which is actually the Roman age, the temperatures have been decreasing in Greenland by two and a half degrees. Al Gore is made out to be a revolutionary figure attempting to save the planet, which is quite true. He just doesn't mention the fact that saving the earth doesn't involve you. According to his agenda, it will result in massive land repossession and extreme limitations on food and water and fossil fuels for the public. And please note that Al Gore is a sustainable developer. The global warming lie is very popular today because it receives major media coverage and has an attractively titled goal of saving the planet. But how does this tie in with Agenda 21? The result of the 1992 Earth Summit Conference in Rio de Janeiro was the Kyoto Treaty. The Kyoto Treaty states that every country must drastically reduce the use of fossil fuels by mandate of the United Nations. Concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are at their highest levels in more than 200,000 years. If the trend does not change, scientists expect the seas to rise two feet or more over the next century. Island chains such as the Maldives will disappear from the map unless we reverse the predictions. Thank you very much. And as of June 2007, 172 nations and other government entities have ratified the treaty. And if you were wondering how this ties into putting the Earth's priority above human survival in accordance with pagan beliefs, every country's deadline for the implementation of Agenda 21 and the Kyoto Treaty is in 2012. And if this wasn't enough, when the Pentagon was damaged in 9-11, they set a goal to have a completely new and improved Pentagon in December of 2012. So Codex Alimentarius goes into effect at the end of 2009, which gives it three years for the Codex regulations on food to create billions of preventable diseases and deaths. When citizens of every nation are dying of starvation and diseases and fear for their lives because of global warming and major catastrophes, they will do what the public has been proven to do in times of great peril. They will beg for their government to step in and do something. How are they going to get you to join the new economy? They're going to say, we have a solution. You see, one of the tricks of the Illuminati is they create a problem and then they provide the solution when you beg them to. 
And pray tell, what will the United Nations suggest when there's a global problem? They will demand a global government, a new world order. Exactly as the Maya, Hopi, Kali Yuga, and many other pagan civilizations prophesized. By 2012, the Kyoto Treaty, Agenda 21, Codex Alimentarius, and the New Pentagon will be fully operational to enforce a new world order. And the new world religion is obvious. We will all worship the Earth, Gaia, the mother goddess we saved from extinction from global warming. We will be told that to keep from repeating the mistakes that we made in the past, we must hold the Earth in higher regard than humans, just as pagan traditions require. This is too obvious to ignore. It is right in front of our faces and yet we still refuse to see it. I guarantee you that by 2012 there will be a World War III, but it will not be between nations. It will be us and them. They know this. Why do you think the UN is consistently trying to disarm the public and the nations? They don't want us to be capable of fighting back. The proof of this is in the film released by the UN called Armed to the Teeth where it demonizes gun ownership. It is also shown in the freedom from war policy put in place by JFK in 1961. President John Kennedy went to the United Nations, September 1961, and he presented the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World uh, during a speech, and he said, this is the official program of the United States of America. It's a disarmament program. It calls for the United States to turn over its military to the United Nations. Now, let that sit for a second. It calls for the United States to turn over its military to the United Nations. The program ends by saying progressive controlled disarmament would proceed to a point where no state would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN Peace Force. The UN would have all military power. This policy outlines some pretty scary scenarios when you understand what it reads. It calls for the disbanding of all national armed forces and the prohibition of their reestablishment in any form whatsoever other than those required to preserve internal order and for contributions to a United Nations Peace Force. This clearly shows that the UN is calling for all military power to be under their control. Inspection and verification must establish both that nations carry out scheduled limitation or reductions and that they do not retain armed forces and armaments in excess of those permitted at any stage of the disarmament process. Strategic delivery vehicles will be reduced. Arms and armed forces will be reduced. And all the while, UN peacekeeping powers would be strengthened. A UN Peace Observation Group would be available to investigate any situation which might constitute a threat to or a breach of the peace. Establishing of a permanent international peace force within the United Nations, and depending on the findings of an experts commission, a halt in the production of chemical, bacteriological, and radiological weapons, and a reduction of the existing stocks or their conversion to peaceful uses. Peaceful uses of biological, chemical, and radiological weapons? Do you see how they are perverting the word peace and making this policy sound unilaterally good? There is no other way to read this publication. It clearly states that all nations will hand over their military forces to a global United Nations military. The U.S. population is currently around 300 million. The national debt is currently around 10 trillion. So the current debt, when divvied among the American people, comes out to approximately $33,000 and has been growing at a national rate of $1.46 billion a day since 2006. Now with electronic banking, wire transfers, and credit cards, people have less physical custody of their money. As of right now, the amount of money in circulation is not able to cover the national debt. This was carefully planned since the inception of the Federal Reserve Bank. And the next planned step by the elite is already in play. George Bush signed a bill implementing the North American Union. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. 
and he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about that I think is going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S., and uh, Mexico. The Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the Amero. You see, the domination of government by business is called fascism. And I'm kind of wondering how many people know what NAFTA is, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Because under Chapter 11 of the NAFTA Agreement, NAFTA tribunals trump all U.S. law if it conflicts with either A, World Bank's International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, or B, UN Commission for International Trade Law. Now, that, that sounds scary enough, but when you understand what that reads, it also gives the power to violate the First and Second Amendment, which is saying, you know, bye-bye to the Constitution. This will weaken national sovereignty and bankrupt the dollar we use now. After this happens, the Fed will call in all debts. When the debts cannot be repaid by the people, assets will be seized. And by this, I mean absolutely everything you own, including your property, your home, your vehicle, your furniture, and the clothes on your back. This plan is already in progress. And when it takes place, you will literally be owned by the Federal Reserve Bank. This is how Agenda 21 will be implemented. The seized land will be given back to nature and the people will be placed in smart growth megacities. So what are we to do? There is an overabundance of information out there for anyone to see pertaining to why this situation seems so hopeless and out of our control. But in all honesty, there is even more information out there about how to protect ourselves. The only problem we face is that most people don't know how to apply this information to their own lives and rarely anybody takes the time to spell it out for us. There are many great teachers out there teachers who have dedicated their lives to protecting the people who need protecting the most. The teacher has the most difficult role in our society because nobody likes attaining true knowledge. True knowledge encompasses all aspects of existence, good and bad. Most others do not. Hearing true knowledge upsets people because it implies that we were wrong at one point in our lives. And another character flaw is our desire to apply absolute truths to unstable foundations in our life. When we do so, we build a structure that we hope will define us best when we're reaching the end of our life on earth. So everything we think we are, everything we tell others we are, everything we base our life-changing decisions off of is all depending on a foundation that could crumble at any moment. And because we've been told our entire lives that there are certain guidelines and mores we must follow to be a decent human being, we deny everything that may pose a threat to our unstable foundation. This is why we despise true teachers. We lump these teachers into the same category as terrorists, and the method for spotting these teachers and terrorists are just as flimsy and ridiculous as the methods used to spot witches. William Cooper, a loving father and husband, friend of many, simply a teacher trying to better humanity and protect fellow citizens across the globe. They became a mystery to the others, and the priesthood was born. No king ever existed without the permission of the priesthood. The kings never had the power, and don't to this day. Kings exist at the whim of the real power, which is the priesthood standing behind the throne. It is a method of encoding information through a system of mathematics and numbers. It is some of the most ancient knowledge that man has ever possessed and has been kept secret and given only to those who have proven themselves worthy through the process of initiation. There's a method to their madness. There's really not much method to yours. 
because you're operating from a place of ignorance. And until you change that, you're going to be bumbling around, bumping into each other, saying and doing the wrong things, not understanding the nature of your en enemy. And if you don't understand the nature of your enemy and the weapons they use, you cannot fight that enemy. You can't fight the battle. You shouldn't even be on the battlefield. Supposedly, a CNN reporter found Osama bin Laden took a television camera crew with him, went into Osama bin Laden's hideout, interviewed him and his top leadership, and he came out and told everybody, within three weeks Osama bin Laden is going to attack the United States and Israel. Now don't you think that's kind of strange, folks? You see, because the largest intelligence apparatus in the world, with the biggest budget in the history of the world, has been looking for Osama bin Laden for years and years and years, and can't find him. Some doofus jerk-off reporter with a camera crew bosses right into his hideout and interviews him. And I'm telling you, be prepared for a major attack. But it won't be Osama bin Laden. It will be those behind the New World Order. I wonder what Osama bin Laden's targets are supposed to be. And if they don't, you know, if this doesn't materialize in the next two or three weeks, it will eventually materialize because they haven't succeeded in getting the guns out of the hands of the American people, nor have they succeeded in taking our freedoms away. And so I can tell you with a certainty, they must do something terrible in order to stop this backlash and regain the sympathy of the mass herds of sheeple out there. This is how it feels to be alive. This is how it What is our common bond truly? Freedom! Freedom! Without freedom, you can't be a Christian no matter what denomination you belong to. You can't be a Buddhist. You can't own a donut shop. You can't drive from here to Oregon. You can't be an American because that's what it's all about. And it's the only thing that it's all about. Nothing else. Nothing else. You know, really understand sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know and try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them and find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. That's why my broadcast scares the hell out of socialists. You see, what happens when you broadcast the truth is you piss everybody off. <laughs> I maintain that the only true salvation from any oppression or enslavement is self-empowerment, knowledge, consciousness. This is true rebellion. Don't get caught up in the 87% of people who follow the leader. People who think that they are rebels because they denounce authority simply because it's the latest fashion. Don't march the streets claiming that you are the enlightened one because you read a book or saw a film that gave you a glimpse into an uncommon knowledge. Don't scream phrases into a megaphone that you borrowed from another person's research. And don't proclaim yourself an original thinker because you belong to a group that represents an unpopular belief. Those are all examples of the other side of the coin of groupthink leading a false rebellion. False rebellion is dangerous because it gives the illusion that you are free and thinking for yourself. 
A true rebellion, a true revolution, begins when you quit following and start leading. And those who end up following you should be taught by you to quit following you and start leading. And the only way to lead successfully is by fully understanding your rights as a human being on this planet. We have very powerful tools on our side called the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. These documents state that no government can deprive us of our natural rights. So how is it happening? You must understand that the elite group controlling our government, our educational system, agriculture, and media are also in control of our free enterprise. Free enterprise is our economic system or our means of production, privately owned and operated for personal benefit. Free enterprise cannot legally be taxed unless it volunteers itself. The reason why income tax seems inescapable is because most every job on the planet requires you to sign a number of documents with fancy wording stating that you are agreeing to be a representative of a corporation or entity. What all this means is simply that when you sign working papers, which are required by pretty much every employer that you apply to, you are waiving your rights as a natural person protected under the Constitution and agreeing to represent an artificial person that is not protected under the Constitution. It's difficult to avoid because if you do not sign the document waiving your rights, you won't get the job. So why does every employer voluntarily pay taxes, which leads to the requirement of those documents? Because without doing so, the business loses all state and federal benefits provided to private or commercial business. And furthermore, most people simply accept the mistruth that income tax is required by law without investigating it. When your name is presented on a document with the first letter of your first and last name capitalized, it represents capitis diminutia minima, which occurs when a man's family relations alone were changed. It's a minimal loss of rights. When your last name appears in capital letters, it represents capitis diminutia media, which occurs when a man loses his rights of citizenship, but not his rights to liberty. This means you can be fined and penalized, but not enslaved or imprisoned. But when your entire name is capitalized on any document, it represents capitis diminutia maxima, which states that a man's condition changes from freedom to bondage. All rights of citizenship and family rights are surrendered. This means you can be fined, imprisoned, and enslaved in any amount for any duration at the whim of the state's suggestion. But it is important to note that if you do not legally bind yourself to these documents stating that you waive your rights and represent a corporation, you do not have to attend any court. There are two kinds of law on the earth, as I've said. One is called civil law, which is the law of the land, and one is called maritime admiralty, which is called the law of water. The maritime admiralty is banking law. So consequently, the corporation and government and people who want to control you, they create a second you, and that second you that they control, that they created, is all capital letters. Check it out. Anytime you get a bill, you get a lawsuit, you get a fine, a ticket, somebody sends you a bill from the Department of Water and Power, check it out on your driver's license, on your Social Security card, on your insurance cards, Anything having to do with business, your name, will always be in all capital letters because only all capital letters can be dealt with by banks and government. You need to wake up and find out how this stuff really works because once you understand that you don't need to submit yourself as an American to a British commercial venture call courts. You're an American. You don't need to go to court. As somebody, you only go to court because you agree to go to court. When they send you a subpoena to court or a summons to court, and they've sent you something, you look at it and say, hey, Jack, that's not me. That's an all capital letters. All capital letters is a corporation. Those who are charged under these maritime admiralty courts usually don't understand that they are voluntarily being fined and imprisoned. When a judge calls your name and asks if you are that name, those who say yes 
are verbally agreeing to represent the artificial person that the name represents. In doing so, you are voluntarily waiving your rights under the Constitution. Your absolute rights as natural persons are the right to life, security, and property. And all of these are very important. Remember that you can never be deprived of these simple rights unless you are willingly waiving them. But you need to understand your rights if you want to be protected under them. When sustainable development is knocking down your door for the right to your property, you need to understand your inherent right to your property, which extends from the visible surface to the center of the earth. But please note that these steps are simply the beginning. They merely treat the symptoms instead of attacking the root. To understand fully how to protect yourself, you need to understand your origin. The true history of this planet has been stifled from the top down. Since the inception of monotheism and the ridicule as well as outlaw in specific cultures of all pagan religions and practices, a lie has been forced upon all civilizations. You have to wonder why powerful empires were threatened enough by paganism to make the practice of such religions punishable by death. This threat didn't end during the Roman Empire. Take a look at how the founders of America by mandate of Great Britain wiped out Native American tribes indiscriminately. Great Britain has also shown some of the most brutal forms of genocide in Africa, India, New Zealand, New Guinea, and many other locations in which pagan tribes still existed. East Timor suffered from one of the most brutal genocides in all of history and was fueled by the United Nations and the United States funding during the Carter administration. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. What happened on December 7th in 1975 is just one of the great, um, great evil deeds of history. Early in the morning, bombs began dropping on Dili. The number of troops that invaded Dili that day almost outnumbered the entire population of the town. And for two or three weeks, there was just, they just killed people. So the Timorese were fleeing into the jungles by the thousands. By late 1977-78, Indonesia set up receiving centers for those Timorese who came out of the jungle waving white flags. Those the Indonesians thought were more educated or who were suspected of belonging to Fredlin or other opposition parties were immediately killed. They took women aside and flew them off to Delhi in helicopters for use by the Indonesian soldiers. They killed children and babies. But in those days, their main strategy and their main weapon was starvation. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same. Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. The last thing that the ones in power want is a sovereign group or tribe setting a positive example for others. It is important to note that followers of monotheistic religions are not to blame, just as not all members of Freemasonry, intelligence agencies, fraternal orders, or political organizations are part of the esoteric agenda that is being carried out in all upper echelons of society. And it's difficult for people to comprehend, but paganism is no more dangerous than understanding surgical procedures. The knowledge can be very useful when applied properly, yet it can also have very detrimental effects if misused or abused. Understand that most all of these problems are not by mistake, but by design. Most people do not understand how colors, shapes, catchwords and phrases, and biological timings are all used as talismans to affect humanity on an emotional and spiritual level. Colors are used hypnotically in every news channel and corporate advertisement. 
Fast food chains typically use vibrant reds, yellows, and whites in their restaurants to cause the customers to feel hurried and restless. This helps the customers filter in and out quicker to make for more customers. Fine dining restaurants, on the other hand, use very earthy, natural colors such as soft greens, blues, and browns to calm the senses and to make for a more lengthy and peaceful meal. And the same goes for the music that is played at these establishments. Specific musical notations and progressions can give relaxing or exciting stimuli to the body without our knowledge. The music industry goes even further and uses natural rhythms of the heart to map out the tempo of pop songs. This is why 72 beats per minute is used very frequently in pop music. Music is not a product of culture. In 1986, the National Academy of Science found that infants prefer consonant sounds such as perfect fifths rather than dissonant ones. This is just a small example of our natural ability to understand sound. So be very careful when placing a child in front of a TV or near a stereo. Those who believe that children cannot comprehend violence on a TV screen or aggression from music are thinking strictly with the left brain. The child may not rationally understand the words or actions on the screen, but the right brain, even in infants, can absolutely understand everything in its immediate environment because it transmits a frequency that can affect us on a subatomic level. Science has even proven that proper sonic vibrations are essential for the health of our vegetation. Studies done on many ecosystems have shown that when a specific species becomes extinct or moves from an area, another species will replace its song patterns to fit the overall harmony of the vibrations required for plant life to thrive. All these are known as talismans and are used very carefully by corporations and the media. Catchphrases are also used to spark certain emotions in the psyche. When the average person hears the words terror, bombing, gunshots, murder, war, assassination, and so on, the body and the mind respond with heightened alertness and caution. And when events such as assassinations of major leaders, bombings, terrorism, or war happen on large scales throughout the world, the body responds differently at different times, marked biologically and astrologically. The tragic event involving the Branch Davidians at Waco and the Oklahoma City bombings claimed the lives of men, women, and children as they ended in flames on April 19th. This date is a pagan holiday where human sacrifice is made by fire. The tragic events of September 11th, 2001 happened on the Mayan calendar date of 6 Emox, which represents large-scale change. And when the U.S. attacked Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, this was the Mayan calendar date of 6K, which represents balancing. Please understand that these weren't prophecies or predictions. The Mayans simply understood the body's natural cycles. So these unfortunate events are not by chance. One needs only to look at the result of the major political decisions of the United States since the inception of the United Nations to catch a glimpse of the ultimate goal. Every major war, assassination, terrorist attack, or security weakness exposed has two specific common themes. One, the unfortunate event makes worldwide news and scares or angers the public. And two, the result, no matter what, is always the expansion of government and the destruction of constitutional freedoms. It doesn't matter what the excuse or the explanation is, the result always tells the truth. A child can give the greatest excuses every time he's too sick for school, but if it always happens on the day of a test, the truth is revealed by the result. The major media outlets can give every explanation in the book as to why war is declared, assassinations happen, and terrorist events take place, but if they all end up in the expansion of government and the destruction of constitutional freedoms, the truth is revealed by the result. And because the vast majority of the public are completely ignorant of natural biological cycles of man, it is increasingly difficult for them to accept that these events are by no means an accident. In my rolling on the floor and trying to protect myself from the heat and being in the pitch black not able to see that the voices of those behind me screaming kind of got through to me. I recognized who they were. Could identify the voices. Uh, are they going to come in and kill me? No. No. Nobody's coming.
was a statement reportedly made by Attorney General Janet Reno during an interview on 60 Minutes. She allegedly defined a cultist as one who has a strong belief in the Bible and the second coming of Christ, who frequently attends Bible studies, who has a high level of financial giving to a Christian cause, who homeschools their children, who has accumulated survival foods, and has a strong belief in the Second Amendment, and who distrusts government. Through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there. Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. At the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. Now, we're also hearing from some witnesses on the scene that they've overheard from firefighters that were first on the scene that there was a possibility that there was a secondary explosive device besides the car bomb device outside the building, and that that device may have been placed near the nursery. Also, we're getting word now that President Clinton is sending anti-terrorism units down here to, to look over the situation to find out exactly what went on and what other danger may be out there in Oklahoma City. That's something we need to think about, unfortunately, this time, because as we've told you, two other explosive devices were found that were not detonated and they were larger than the first. The reports I have is that one device was uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. So President Clinton just called Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosive expert, um, obviously with this type of explosion. Now, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City, but it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. First bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. First bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. First bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. Still another problem, according to these groups, is the executive branch making a grab for much more police power. Some of it highly questionable in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing. It shouldn't be the case that Americans have to worry that their phone could be tapped. It shouldn't be the case that Americans have to worry that their credit records could be made accessible by the FBI without them being involved in any criminal activity. The first draft of the House anti-terrorism bill was so loose it could let authorities define as an act of terrorism prosecutable by the federal government everything from threatening your spouse with a gun to blocking an abortion clinic. While the anti-terrorism bills ask for sweeping new powers, the ACLU and others also worry about numerous executive orders that the public knows little about. These orders could give the president, federal agencies, and the military near dictatorial powers.
Talk to any police official anywhere, and pretty soon he'll bring up the shootout. February 1997. Two bank robbers in full body armor and firing AK-47s did battle with police on the streets of North Hollywood, California. It was every officer's worst nightmare come true. Cops outgunned by the bad guys. The one weapon that we've identified can go through a bulletproof vest at 200 yards. After the L.A. shootout, requests for surplus machine guns increased dramatically. The Los Angeles Police Department alone got 600 M16s from surplus. Nationwide, the number given away more than doubled this year. And many departments decided to issue them to regular patrol officers on daily duty, all because of one shootout in one city. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. We worth it? Because she believes the sanctions are working. In November 1997, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark headed a delegation of the International Action Center on his seventh trip to Iraq to investigate the continued effects of the United Nations sanctions on the population. We were shocked by what we saw an almost total absence of medicines, medical supplies, and spare parts for the equipment. Despite the heroic efforts of medical personnel, babies, children, and the chronically ill continued to die in vast numbers. The United States government claims that Saddam Hussein is to blame for the crisis. What is the real cause of the suffering? The sanctions. They are an extension of the 1991 United States war against the Rock. The goal was to cripple a rock's infrastructure and make civilian life unsustainable. We demonstrated the capacity of technology to cripple a country without ever setting foot on it in the Persian Gulf. It's important to recognize that because it goes hand in hand with the sanctions. When we merely say that we flew 110,000 aerial sorties in 42 days, one every 30 seconds on the average, 24 hours a day, we ignore what we really did. As officials said the death toll was now 288, with many more to come. The trucks kept filling up and driving away, past waiting relatives who knew they might never be able to identify the bodies of their loved ones. The community of Amaria filled one of the first of many funerals with gunfire and sign of grief and fury and with angry words aimed through foreign journalists. My mother, she's gone, shouted this young man. This woman asked, could not all your modern technology tell you that there were children and women here? Bill Blakemore, ABC News, in the Amaria district of Baghdad. We destroyed every silo for grain or anything else storing food in the whole country. We destroyed all the storage and processing of food plants throughout the country. Even dates, the world's biggest exporter of dates. Famous processing and packaging plants in Baghdad. Deliberately destroyed. We didn't want them to be able to feed themselves for a long, long time. We're all aware of the famous little powdered milk plant. The, the United States government says that in this factory here you are making chemical weapons. Is that true? No, that's not true. 
They are lie because this is milk for children. Uh -huh. This powder, milk of children. Uh -huh. Nothing else was made, only this in the factory? Yes, and you can see in yourself. With the only factory in the Middle East to produce powdered milk, they were producing about 17% of their powdered milk requirements. We destroyed that, cut off all the milk. The malnutrition of the mothers immediately jeopardized all of the infants. 70% of the pregnant women, even today in Iraq, suffer anemia. The death rate for children has soared compared to 1989, the last year before sanctions. One of the biggest causes of death in Iraqi children today is diarrhea and dysentery due to the untreated drinking water. Iraq's water purification plants were heavily bombed in the war, and many that were repaired have broken down. The United Nations banned the import of spare parts and chlorine into Iraq to purify water. We saw the effects of this policy in the hospitals. This is the second attack for of acute bloody diarrhea, anemic dysentery. Most of them are due to contamination of water. Is malnourished, anemic, underweight with a development of the neck. Do you have tap water there? No. You can see the conditions of these children shouldn't shouldn't happen anywhere, and it's caused by the sanctions. The United States government insists upon. life we perceive with our five senses is not reality. Quantum physics has shown that space and time are illusions of perception. Therefore our bodies cannot truly be a reality if they occupy this space. Ernest Rutherford performed an experiment in Manchester that revealed to him the shape of the interior of an atom. Scientists were shocked to discover that the atom is almost entirely empty space. The question then became how could this empty atom possibly make the solid world around us? Our true consciousness does not exist in our brains or in our bodies. But this illusion of our individual bodies along with the misinformation of our true origins has manifested the idea that we all think independently from one another. With this misunderstanding, it would seem impossible to scientifically explain telepathy, clairvoyance, spiritual mediums, and other phenomena dealing with transferring information between sources without physical means of communication. But when you understand that there is a common spiritual bond between all things in the universe, and that we are all part of one divine intelligence, no phenomena is unexplainable. This simple understanding fills all the holes in modern religions. It explains reincarnation, deja vu, predictions of the future, and literally every event, occurrence, or anomaly ever experienced. The blank matter within the most basic building blocks of perceivable existence is malleable and molded by intent. This means that consciousness shapes our reality. This seems difficult to accept for most, and it is quite understandable. In modern times, we are taught from an early age how to think rationally and tangibly. This is a very left brain method of education and it has more harmful effects than it's given credit for. The left brain deals with logic, details, facts, patterns, practicality, science, and math. As the right brain deals with feeling, intuition, symbols, images, risk taking, philosophy, and religion. With a deliberate push for government-controlled educational curriculums, generation after generation of the youth are being taught to focus only on the facts, figures, and numbers. Repetition is used to train children subconsciously to accept what they're learning. Children aren't rewarded for questioning the validity of the information they receive. They're ridiculed. However, the children who blindly accept the information as true and merely regurgitate the information on command when it is time to take a test, 
Those children go on to become the decision makers in our government, law, medicine, business, and every other occupation with power and prestige. The most detrimental effect of being pushed away from holistic thinking with the full brain into a strictly left brain thought is what is known as the suppression of the feminine. Every male and female have both feminine and masculine qualities. It has nothing to do with man or woman. These are represented by the left and right brain, yin and yang, black and white, light and dark, and most every other duality. Both are vital to our spiritual and physical health. In ancient Egypt, the female was the rightful heir to the throne. The male she chose to marry became Pharaoh. This depicted the goddess tradition that has been destroyed to make way for a patriarchal, male-dominated society we see enforced in every major denomination. In suppressing the feminine of every society and pushing the people to strictly left-brain thinking, the natural ability for humanity to feel earthly, cosmic, and personal energy became lost. Traditions that were passed on through shamans, witch doctors, magicians, psychics, and seers of all kind became outlawed and ridiculed and given a stigma of something out of a Hollywood movie. Every religion explains that we are children of God and have godliness inside of us. If you erase the anthropomorphized God and understand that God is nothing more than the spiritual web that connects all things, all religious scriptures begin to make much more sense. Our bodies are merely vessels to contain our spirit, to gather experience for the divine mind. This is how evolution is possible. It is scientifically proven that all species are evolving into more complex beings. Innate knowledge or racial memory within all species is the understanding of newborns of all kinds to automatically know specific details and traits that the mother does not have to teach them. Therefore, innate knowledge helps every species naturally evolve towards more complex organisms. Lyle Watson claims that it was a Japanese scientist who observed the hundredth monkey effect in 1952. In this observation, he discovered that a certain portion or percentage of monkeys learned or developed a new trait. The knowledge became an innate ability in that species. This is further testimony to a collective consciousness among species. Everything in existence has a natural vibration to it, from our atoms all the way to the vastness of the universe. To show a simple connection between the earth and our bodies, take a look at our body's harmonic focal points, better known as our chakras. Just as there are harmonic focal points on the guitar string, there are locations within our body where our vibrations culminate. In Eastern philosophies, these seven chakras are used to bring health and balance to the physical and spiritual body. Our earth also has seven chakra points at equally distant locations from one another. There is one chakra point on each continent. The root chakra is in Mount Shasta, California. The sexual chakra is in the Isle of Sun, Lake Titicaca in South America. The solar plexus chakra is in Yulura Kata Juta in Australia. The heart chakra is in Glastonbury or Shaftesbury, England. The throat chakra is where the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt are. The heart chakra is at Kuhe Malaksia in Iran and the crown chakra is at Mount Kailas in Tibet. Scientifically, this is explained because at the core of our Earth, there is a molten iron crystal that resonates at approximately 7 Hz. There are energy vortexes all over the Earth where electromagnetic energy emanates. There are also several vile vortices surrounding the equator where strange anomalies occur, such as radio and compass malfunctions, as well as plane and ship disappearances. You may have heard of a few of these. So the intangible parts of our existence, such as emotions, are part of the true reality of higher consciousness. If emotions are part of a realm that we cannot experience with our five senses, then how is it that we are all aware of our emotions? What most people believe to be emotions are not truly the emotion itself. What we are experiencing is the physical manifestation of these emotions. Anger causes disturbance in the psyche which manifests itself in the ego. These manifestations cause the heart rate to increase, body temperature to rise, and spawn many other physical traits that signify anger. Just as music from the radio is a physical manifestation of an intangible signal, our experience of emotion is the physical manifestation of an intangible signal as well. It has been shown that our emotions have a vibratory frequency to them. Furthermore, there are only two emotions that humankind experiences, fear and love. All other emotions branch either directly or indirectly from these two emotions.
Fear has a long and slow frequency vibration to it, while love has a very rapid and high frequency. To show that vibration is the very foundation of existence, Hans Jene developed what is known as cymatics in the 1940s to show that when vibrations of sound are passed through a form of media, there is a set pattern that will follow. When the frequency increases, the media develops into a more complex pattern. This is precisely what is happening to our Earth and to humanity. There are 64 possible codes of amino acids in our DNA structure made from four elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. By any means of logic, we should have all 64 codes activated within our DNA structure. Yet we presently only have 20 active codes. And of these 64 possibilities, it appears that only 20 of these codes are turned on right now for us, the 20 amino acids. There is a switch that turns off and turns on where those coding sites lie, and that the switch uh, for that turning off and turning on is what we call emotion. And this is the first time that we've ever seen the patterns of emotion directly physically linked to human genetic material. Well, fear is a long, slow wave of emotion. So this wave of fear is a long, slow wave and touches relatively few sites on this DNA. So an individual living in fear is limited to the number of antenna that they have available to them. Whereas an individual uh, living in the pattern of love, this is love, in DNA, you can see it's, it's a higher frequency, shorter uh, wavelength. We have many more potential sites for coding uh, along that genetic pattern. This information, this is amazing. This is the first time we've ever had a hard digital link between emotion and genetics. This is important to understand because another researcher named Vladimir Popinov measured tiny particles of light called photons inside a vacuum tube. The photons were scattered as expected. A sample of DNA was then entered into the vacuum tube and they measured the photons again. They found that the particles of light aligned themselves along the axis of the DNA. Then, as they removed the DNA sample, the photons remained aligned to the same form of the DNA even though no DNA was present. This is what is known as the phantom DNA experiment. Science has now bridged a very important gap between physical and ethereal or spiritual. Our emotions directly affect the structure of our DNA, which directly shapes the physical world we experience every day. So the messages left by the ancients that we've explained here were more than just prophecies about a one world government or a new world order. We now understand why the study of the heavenly bodies were so important. The rotation and orbit of all that makes up our universe serves as a clock to map changes and transitions. This helped the ancients understand that the change of the heavenly bodies were a mirror to the changes of all existence. December 21st, 2012 is simply a natural transition from one form of energy to the next, the transcendental evolution of man. This date is what's known as zero point. Our sun, as well as our planet Earth, is losing its magnetic field as the Earth is slowing in its rotation. All the while, its base resonant frequency, also known as the Schumann cavity resonance, is increasing in accordance with the predictable sequence of the Fibonacci theory. At a cellular level, our bodies respond to an electromagnetic pulse. The ancients called this the sacred circuit. The cells receive this pulse from the brain, which receives its pulse from the heart, which receives its pulse from the earth. This pulse comes from the solar system, which from there comes from the galaxy, which ultimately comes from our entire universe. We literally share a pulse with all of existence. Yet another example of everything being one. For as long as scientists have been recording the Earth's pulse, it has remained at approximately 7.8 cycles per second. This was a constant fixed number until 1986 into 1987. It rapidly began increasing to about 9 cycles per second in 1996. So in one decade, it increased by about 2 cycles per second. By 2012, this pulse will be right around 13 cycles per second, just as the Fibonacci theory indicates. What does this mean for humanity? Just as cymatics has shown that higher frequencies result in more complex patterns, we are now experiencing the beginning of a major shift in both physical and spiritual vibration. 
It's difficult to understand what exactly will happen to our physical bodies, but ancient scriptures, pagan and monotheistic religions, mystery schools, and secret fraternal orders have all given indications as to what this experience will be like. This will be the shift of the ages, the transcendental period of monumental changes to humanity. Those unprepared for this transition will likely not be able to cope with the rapid changes in the psyche. The only way to prepare for what is to come is what we have sought after for our entire lives. Truth. Not the truth about governments, commerce, religions, terrorism, or anything external, but the truth within ourselves, within our psyche and our shadow self. Especially in Western cultures, we are taught that being normal means only being happy and never sad, only loving and never angry, only forgiving and never jealous. This sounds plausible, but it is not. We are not meant to repress any negative emotions because it causes imbalance. To conquer our emotions, we must embrace them, not fight them. We must acknowledge them and allow them to serve their purpose as we learn from them. The ancient Essene culture left teachings dating back about 6,000 years. They taught that our relationships with one another, with the universe, and with situations and events are mirrors of the parts of our psyche that need to be cleansed. Author Greg Braden beautifully explains this entire segment at great length in his work. His hard work and understanding of these subjects contributed largely to the marriage between science and spirituality. It is very important to understand that when you fear loss, fear death, fear war, fear terrorism, or fear change, you are giving others the ability to control you based on those fears. When you fight against poverty or against racism, when you fight for relationships or for freedom, you are outwardly attempting to repress that which has been placed before you to conquer inwardly. These situations are mirrors of our fears. This is why it is important to love and only love. Love those who stand with you, but especially those who stand against you. Don't look at your fears as a threat, rather understand that this material world is only a physical manifestation of either the love or fear in your consciousness. It's as plain as day. All you need to conquer in your life is in your face. If you want to understand what your true inner fears are, analyze your ambitions and your inhibitions. Everything explained here about the esoteric agenda of the elite few at the very top is nothing to fear. They have been at work for thousands of years behind the scenes to manipulate humanity. And it has worked. Until now. It's very easy for any system of thought, religious or otherwise, that comes along. It's very easy to play on that, to play on our insecurities, to assure us all is well, we'll all be taken care of. We lap that up. So don't blame religion. Blame our own insecurities, which has allowed religion to flourish and which has allowed so many systems of thought that are disempowering to flourish throughout human history. That's why we can't get out of it. Ron Sakely, department chairman, Chemistry, University of California, Berkeley, showed that DNA acts as an antenna for cellular upregulation. The primary function they taught us about what DNA is about. It's a receiver and transmitter of photons, light and phonon sound. For what? Cellular upregulation, meaning that they're water molecules, the pyramid power around the DNA spiral energizing strands are taking in the spiritual energy of love vibrations and then sending it out for manifesting, precipitating in a quantum field, the physical matter of the body. These are hertz frequencies or cycles per second that the musicians can retune their instruments to play and experiment with. Why? Again, these are the creator's musical scale, the original solfeggio, buried for 3,000 years in the Bible. So the ancient priests who knew how to levitate the huge stones for the building of the pyramids and the Masonic knowledge that predated ancient Egypt the ability to have this information, these frequencies, serve the function of creation, destruction, and miracles on behalf of the empowered people who had access to this knowledge. I say that because of this metaphor.
This is the difference between the power of the, our Creator and anything else, particularly evil. That you can go into a pitch black room full of evil, full of darkness, and light a little candle, and instantly that darkness flees. But you can't do the opposite. You can't go into a well-lit room full of truth and wisdom and righteousness and joy and health and harmony with the universal power. You can't take a, any amount of darkness and go into that well-lit room and have any effect whatsoever. That is the metaphor which I frequently think of when I think that I'm not empowered. It is the greatest lesson for me and I think for everybody else to know that we're on the winning side and that we win in the end. As you are watching this, understand that it is not a fight to be fought. It is not a war to be waged. No gun rights have to be exercised. Not a finger has to be lifted. Most people wonder how one person can make a difference. They ask that if all this is so simple and this information is available, why hasn't someone else conquered their fears and changed the world for everyone else? This is the most difficult and beautiful conundrum to our lives. Your reality affects you and only you. Your curiosity has led you to this genre of information to serve a very specific purpose in your life. To understand visually how the universe is truly a hologram, a math professor at Yale University developed the formula that is plugged into a computer program. Named after him, the Mandelbrot set shows a seemingly disorganized pattern. But no matter how far you zoom into the design, you will always find the same pattern within the whole pattern. Each fractal, broken down infinitely, will always reflect the whole. When one fractal changes its pattern, the sum total of the whole pattern changes along with it. This exemplifies that the whole world does not need to be awoken. There is no race to inform the six billion people on this planet of this message. It is only important that you, personally, learn to conquer your innermost fears and learn to love. When you see your fears for what they are and master your emotions, then, and only then, will you truly be free.